after that dark and stormy flood, adrift for forty nights, from the hand of God came a promise. After the darkness of the wilderness, years wandering lost, trying to hold on to faith, he gave a promise land. From the darkness of a mother's womb, all the questions, all the expectation, God formed a child. And from the darkness of that silent night, when it seemed the voice of God was unheard, when it seemed the hand of God was unseen, that silence was broken by the cries of a baby, a son, a savior. God wasted nothing. Even our darkness. For we know that for those who love God, even in our times of darkness, God is working for our good. So today, in the midst of whatever darkness you feel, know this. The day a light has dawned. Hope is not lost. Hope is never lost. Today, hope. Oh, 
while, he was also working at Modo in College as a professor. Um, and he was, you know, writing for the college and still publishing things. Eventually, um, his talents got known by Harvard. And Harvard said, hey, who wants you to come, come work for us? And I was like, all right, I, I think I can do that. But first, I want you to send me to Europe. Pay for me to go over to Europe for about a year, because I want to study European literature. I want to study the languages. So that's exactly what he did. He uh, went over to uh, Europe, spent a year there, and he learned like six or seven different languages. Uh, learned like German, and Italian, Icelandic, French. Uh, and the purpose of this was so that he could understand the literature he was studying and to broaden his own perspectives. He comes back, starts teaching at Harvard. He's still writing, all right? Although he's, he's teaching at Harvard, he's still writing, and he's having a successful career. And this guy is making thousands of dollars a year. Now, of course, in our, our time, thousands of dollars isn't a lot of much. We make tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. But in his time, it was a lot of money. Um, he was very, very successful, very well known. People loved what he wrote. And eventually, he met uh, another individual, he met another young lady, and he went to her <coughs> and said, I like you, will you marry me? And she's like, nope. <laughs> and so he got kind of flustered by that, so he went to her dad and um, said, hey, you know, I proposed to her, but she said no. Can you, like, kind of convince her? <coughs> He's like, sorry, you're, you're on your own. She's it's a very independent woman. She, uh, nothing I can say is going to convince her. So, for seven years, he pursues this woman. Eventually, um, she says yes. Eventually, she says, you know what? You've been pursuing me long enough. You have a really successful career. All right, we'll get married. Now, I need you to understand that while he loved his first wife, this second one was on a whole other level. He, he was obsessed with her. He was madly in love with this, with this woman. And they had, I think, like six kids. And so he tried to always do things with her, always bring her into his world, always bring her into his life. And, you know, he's, he's commented, uh, or he's done it as commenting in his journals that, you know, when he attends things, parties and different events when she's not there, everything seems so much worse. Everything seems dull and boring. Colors are very bland. Food is, is not very appetizing. And he, he says that she brings the light to his world, that she is his rock. Well, the Civil War starts to happen, and this bothers Longfellow a great deal. Because as I said, him and his family are, are huge Americans. They love their country. So to see their country, their countrymen fighting amongst themselves, it really bothered him. And his son enlisted and fought the Civil War. And he had gotten injured. He was in the infirmary. And his mom was writing him a letter, kind of just trying to, you know, keep his spirits up, just trying to, you know, tell him that she loves him and she's there for him. But in the process, the story goes, in the process of sealing the letter with the sealing wax that they used to use, she knocked the match off the table and would hit the ground. It ignited, which then ignited her dress. Well, Longfellow is sleeping in the other room and he hears her scream, so he gets up and he's frantic. <laughs> and he grabs the, the rug on the floor and he just starts hitting her with it, just starting to try to smolder the, uh, extinguish the flames. And when he's noticing it's not working, he's, he goes into the other room to get some water and to, to dump it on. Uh, he eventually does get the fire out, but in the process, he gets burned. And gets burned pretty badly. So imagine someone that you have that sort of attachment to goes through something that horrific as getting burned, and then a few days later passing away. That's horrible. I mean, I can't imagine what he was going through. <coughs> but what made it even worse was that his injuries caused him not to be able to attend her funeral. This is the point that he was madly in love with, that he couldn't even attend her funeral. And it's these stories, these events, that inspire his poems, that inspire that I heard the, Christmas, or I heard the bells on Christmas Day. And for each of us, 
we go through the same exact thing. We have moments where we're really high. You know, we are just having a great life. Family's doing really well. Kids are doing really well. Our career is amazing. But then it plummets, and we go into a really deep valley. And we get to this really dark place. And that's where he was um, after his second wife had died. Now, understand, he got really depressed after his first wife died, but when his second wife died, he got addicted to drugs, opium, and different drugs they used to use. And again, in his comments in his journal that he was really afraid people were going to throw him in the asylum because he was just so upset. Uh, wouldn't eat for days, wouldn't come out of his home. Um, and so we can, we can relate to that. Uh, maybe not in that extreme, but we can relate to that where, you know, our job that we've had for 10 years lays us off and now we're scrounging around for money to take care of our family or you know a family member passes away either by natural causes or by an accident and we get in this really dark dark place and, and we really question you know what is this about god why are you doing this i'm a christian i go to church i tithe i you know volunteer in the church why are these things happening well i i'm no different i've i've had my moments where i'm really really high and i've had my moments where i'm really really low uh, back in 2001 my, my younger brother got diagnosed with cancer at the age of nine and that you know rocked my world it really shook me to the core and, and through my teen years it really caused me to question everything that i had known now i'm saying i was raised in the church in the methodist church uh, i was active in sunday school i was, I was active as an acolyte And when I was going through those dark times, I was just like a long fellow. If you read the poem, in the very beginning, it's all really good. Things are great. Things are awesome. And then he starts to go into his valley. There's a war going on. He's had his wives pass away. And he's just, the, the poem turns really dark and really depressing. But then it makes another turn, and it goes back to joy. It goes back to joy because upon reflection, he realizes the truth of it all. He realizes one day when he's, the Christmas season's going on, he hears the bells being rung at his local church declaring that Jesus was born. And it reminds him, this is why I'm here. This is why these things have happened because Jesus, my Lord, is taking care of me. I may not understand it sometimes. I may not understand what the darkness is. But I know that my Lord is going to save me. He's going to pull me from that darkness. He's going to grab me by the hands. He's going to pick me up, dust me off, and carry me to another mountain. Carry me to another time when things are really, really good. This is the same for each of us. As, as you go through your life, as you go from highs to lows, back to highs, we have to constantly remember those bells being rung by the church, reminding us of what is important. I want to admit, I really love the Christmas season. I like Christmas gifts, I like giving Christmas gifts, I like the food, I like being around my family. But at the end of the day, it's not about that. It's not about the Christmas tree, it's not about Christmas lights. It's about Jesus. It's about His birth. It's about the start of our salvation. Right? Because without that moment that changed history forever, without His birth, this would not exist. I wouldn't be here. God wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be sitting in the pews. Because Christianity wouldn't have existed. It is because His birth that we are saved. It is because of His birth that we are free to spend the rest of eternity with Him in paradise. It is because of His birth that we can celebrate this Christmas day, that we can celebrate this time with family to enjoy it. You know, if you look at what the early Christians had to deal with when they were celebrating His birth, it wasn't anything like this. 
They didn't get the chance to have Black Friday to buy Christmas gifts for friends and family. They didn't get the chance to put up a Christmas tree and hang up Christmas lights. They had to hide. They had to go in a deep, dark cave, and they had to hide. Because if they told people they were Christians, they would get persecuted. So, who are you in regards to the Christmas season? You are Christ's beloved child. He wants to be there for you. And he wants to remind you through Christmas carols, through Christmas songs, through hymns, through poems, about what's important. And I ask you, what is it to you that reminds you of that birth? Now, what, what during this Christmas time tells you, hey, you know what, in a few weeks, in a few days, the greatest person in my life is born, my Savior, my Lord, my Shepherd. And then, how do you take that? How do you take those Christmas bells, whatever it is that, that you use to remind yourself, how do you take that into the world? Now, I'm not talking about the world global. Right? I'm not talking about everything else. I'm talking about your specific world. How do you share this joy? How do you share this excitement that we're about to experience in just a few days? How do you share it with someone who's a non-believer? How do you share it with an atheist? How do you share it with an agnostic? How do you share it with another person of another denomination? And that's my challenge to you. My challenge to you this week, and not just this week, but throughout 2015, is sharing Christ's joy, His birth, with people in your world. Share it with those that you interact with so that maybe that one moment where you share, it brings that person around the valley and brings them back to a mountaintop. That's my challenge to you this week. So church, I'm going to pray for you and then we'll continue. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your birth. And please watch over us as we go into the